Inside Premiere Pro, we're gonna drag our footage down onto the timeline on top of the footage that you're already watching right now. Then you're gonna use your transform properties to roughly get the clip into the right position. Then go to your effects, search for corner pin, apply that to your replacement footage, and you should see these little corner anchors appear on the footage. Drag those corners to the corresponding corners of the screen, and boom, we've now shaped, scaled, positioned, and basically put the screen at the correct angle of the frame and check this out. If I go stand over here, mess around with the blending modes of the opacity, boom, we got some reflections now, yo. Cool beans, right? It wasn't my intention, hopefully, to waste your time with this intro. If you know what you're doing in video editing and the only thing that you needed was to know the effect, it's called corner pin. You apply it like I just did and there you go. But you almost so might be saying, that's not my example. That's not how I'm doing my screen replacement. What if it's green screen? In fact, I'm going like this and I'm breaking my footage. Like this technique doesn't work then, right? Well, that's what the rest of this video is for. Let's hop right into it. For example, if I apply corner pin to this cell phone the exact same way that I just showed you, the proportions are completely off. So this part of the video is going to cover how to replace different aspect ratio green screens, as well as give you some quick tips on how to make that look more realistic. And then I'm gonna get into how certain blending modes react to different colored screens like black, white, and gray, as opposed to just green. And by the way, if you're looking for a tutorial on how to track a moving screen like this, I'll cover that in a later video because it's much easier to do this effect inside After Effects with Mocha. But for now, I'm specifically focused on doing this effect with stationary shots in Premiere Pro. Before before I address the green screen footage, let me show you that the screen over here on the left will work completely fine with corner pin because its aspect ratio is the same as my footage, which is 16 by 9. A couple tips here are one, lower the opacity of your replacement footage, two, use your zoom controls on the bottom left of the program monitor to do some fine detail work, and then three, if you aren't seeing the corner anchors from the corner pin, it's because you have to highlight the actual effect corner pin inside the effects controls to see them. Now, like I showed you before, if you try the same process with the iPad and iPhone, the picture isn't shaped correctly because they don't have the same aspect ratio. I don't know the exact aspect ratios of these devices, so I'm gonna look up their resolutions. And that's what you see in these clip names here. My iPad Pro is 2048 by 2732 and my iPhone is 1170 by 2532. To apply these dimensions, we first need to nest our clips. Right click, nest. To keep things in order, I'll name the nested sequence with the dimensions and object it's replacing. If you click and highlight the motion parameters in the effects controls window, you can see that we still have a 16 by 9 box. Double click the nested sequence on the timeline to open it up. Go to Sequence, Sequence Settings, and change the frame size to the screen resolution of the device. Now right click the clip and hit Set to Frame Size. At this point, it's your creative choice. If you're using a screen recording for that specific device and it already fits the frame correctly, just keep it. But for me, I'm using a video and I'm getting black bars on the top and bottom. For this example, I'm gonna fill it, so I'll do some additional scaling. Going back to our original sequence, you can see that now we have the right aspect ratio. Before placing that one, let me also repeat these steps for the iPhone. Right click, nest, label. Double click the nested sequence on the timeline to open it up. Sequence settings and apply the resolution. For my specific iPhone, it's going to be 1170 by 2532 pixels. Scale to your liking and let's go back to the main sequence. We can now apply the corner pin effect like we did before and shape them accordingly. The nice thing about using these nested sequences is now we have the capability to interchange out the footage to whatever we want to and it will always update inside the main sequence. I'll unenable these clips that we just worked on for the time being and move on to removing the green screen using the ultra key effect. To use it, go to your effects panel, search for ultra key, apply that to your clip, take the eyedropper and select the color that you want to remove. A good rule of thumb is to mask out each separate green screen with its own separate instance of ultra key because these greens may be different than the others. As you can see here in this example, if I click on this screen, I still have some remnants left over on the other screens. If your visual only has one green screen replacement that you're doing, it's still a good idea to create a garbage mat around that screen and then dial in those settings, duplicate that ultra key effect, invert the mat, and then dial in settings for 
all of the surrounding green screen spill. And that's a version of what I'm doing here. I'm adding three instances of the ultra key effect to isolate each screen. And then I'm placing a fourth instance of the ultra key effect on the bottom to suppress the green screen spill on the surrounding objects. The main sliders you need to know about to fine tune your green screen selection are under matte generation. I would start with the pedestal and then manipulate the other sliders from there. For the everything else key, I'll disable all of my other ultra keys. That way I'm able to select select this green on the iPad. One tip here for the eyedropper is to hold control on Windows or command on Mac, and it will make your color picker bigger. This will allow you to select a wider sample. Let me turn these back on and go to the wrench down here to switch from composite view to alpha. Here what we're looking for is everything that is black is going to be clear and see-through. Everything that's white isn't. Our problem lies in this gray area. We just want strictly black and white not really any gray. And to fix this with my specific example, I'm going to adjust the transparency slider. Just so you can see what I'm doing, I'm going to undo this and switch it back to composite view. Here we have that noisy black area, and I'm going to do the same adjustment to the transparency, and now we have a nice bright reflection that isn't green. Now I'm gonna take this background layer and move it to the top of all of my dancing clips in the timeline. I'll enable my clips, and now we've successfully replaced our green screens. But I don't wanna stop there. I wanna show you four quick and dirty tricks that you can do to make it look like these visuals are more a part of the environment that they were shot in. For starters, I think that the image is a little too digitally crisp. Go to our effects and look up Gaussian Blur. This will help us soften up the image. I don't wanna add too much because obviously it looks like this. I would say something like five is a nice number. The next thing I wanna do, I'm going to look up tint apply that to my iPad. For this to work decently, we need to have white and black to pick from in our background image. I'll go to my color picker for white, click a white, go to my color picker for black, click a black from the background image, and it looks black and white, of course. All we need to do is bring our tint down to a decent level. Now the colors between the iPad and the background footage look closer together. Now I've already done this same exact process on both of my other images because the next thing that I like to do is add an adjustment layer above all of this. So I'm gonna go to my project window, go to the new item, adjustment layer, drag that on above everything, go back to our effects, look up Lumetri, add Lumetri color to the adjustment layer above everything, go to our creative, and then add a different look. Maybe something like this, and then you can take that intensity and bring it down a little bit so it's not as forward in the image. For reference, this is what we have now. This is what it looked like before. One last thing you could do to add reflections back into your image artificially is to add a photo of a ceiling or something similar that would be reflected on that glass from the screen. Then I will change this to lighten, go to the pen tool, on the opacity, draw a mask around just the iPad, feather this out like so. Now we can take this down to maybe 25, like 20. That's if you wanna add back in fake reflections, but there are easier ways to maintain the natural reflections that occur on the screen in the environment in some situations. Here I'm looking at one of my Google Earth Studio After Effects tutorials on YouTube. There is no screen replacement going on. This is me actually looking at the video on the screen for reference. Now here is what the screen looks like when it's completely black and nothing's playing. Now here's my corner pinned screen replacement with no blending mode. And if I turn the blending mode to screen on either of the clips, we get this. You can try other modes to see if you can get anything better, but I find that screen was the winner for me here on black. Now I switch my monitor to a completely bright white. It doesn't allow me to capture any reflections on the screen, but using this method lets light spill naturally onto the surrounding objects like the keyboard and table. That's something you don't get with a black screen. As for blending modes, all of them in this section seem to do the best besides color burn. Now that got me thinking, since black is awesome at maintaining reflections on the screen, and white is great at spilling all of that light onto the surrounding objects around the screen, why don't we try 50% gray or some version of gray to get the best of both worlds? Except in real world application, or at least in my example, I couldn't get this to work well. Some of the blending modes were too dull, some were too dark, others just maintained that gray too much in the picture. All in all, I couldn't really find a good fit for a gray screen. By looking at all of these, if somebody were to come up to me tomorrow and ask me to do a shoot with a screen replacement in it, and they know that they wanted to maintain the reflections, 
I would probably go with the black screen and use the screen blending mode. Now keep in mind, this is much easier to accomplish with an unobstructed view of your screen. I don't have any hands in front of the screen. Nothing is crossing the camera and the screen. The moment that happens, it's probably easier to use a green screen to mask out all of that quickly. If this video was helpful, don't forget to leave that thumbs up. My name's Javier Mercedes, and until next time, I hope you're out there living a life of abundance. Bye.